Dr. McCauley, Laurie. I'm so glad to be here again with you. It's my favorite pastime, actually, to talk to you about dogs and fitness and sport and rehabilitation. Hi, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. I love being here. I love being able to help um, professionals and pet parents learn more to take care of their dogs so they can have a totally optimum life. I have to confess to everyone that uh, when we were starting the podcast or the recording, the video recording, uh, that I was having a hard time to fit your titles in the screen. And that actually says a lot about your accomplishments, but also about your dedication to dogs and medicine and what you love to do. So I know that today our plan is to talk cruciate ligaments, cruciate ligament and tears. And, and I know that it's one of the most common condition and surgical conditions in veterinary medicine in dogs. And uh, we are going to unravel the whole um, world and challenges around cruciate, li cruciate, canine cruciate ligament tears and injuries. Why don't we just start with uh, what cruciate ligament is and where it is and what it does and how it uh, participates in uh, mobility and happiness. Absolutely. And I brought some fun toys to show you because I'm a visual person. So to me, it's always easier to understand things if you have something to look at. I'm going to slide up a little bit so I can be even closer. So actually, let's start with this. Start big and go small. So here's pelvis. <clears throat> here's the hip. Comes down to the knee. And there's a little patella or kneecap right there. And then the tibia and then the hock or ankle would be down below that. So now if we come up. These guys don't have patellas on them, but they're nice to see. So here is the femur coming down. Here's the tibia, the fibula, the little bone on the outside. And if we look straight in, the kneecap would be sitting right here, way in there. Now we're going to turn it around from the back is a cruciate ligaments. So you have the meniscus on the side there, and then you have your cranial and caudal cruciate ligaments right in there. The purpose of the cruciate ligament is to prevent the tibia from moving forward and from rotating. Mostly moving forward, but it does some rotation as well. So when we check, what we're literally doing is stabilizing the femur and grabbing that tibia and saying, can we move it forward? And if we can, then we know there's cruciate damage. Mm -hmm. So we want that to be stable because otherwise, every time the dog takes a step, that tibia moves forward and that grinds on the cartilage and we can have a meniscal tear and we get arthritis. And then if we go to this one, you can see again, here's my femur, my patella or kneecap would sit right there. We start to get inflammation in there. I see the inflammation right there. Absolutely. And the reason we tear the cruciate more so than like a medial or lateral collateral ligament or some of the other stabilizing factors is because cause it's inside the joint. Mm -hmm. So when we have inflammation, that joint fluid goes from being thick like motor oil to thin like lemonade. And then that cruciate ligament fibers start to pop, 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 pop. And then we see so many dogs that have a partial CCL or cranial cruciate ligament tear where those fibers are starting to pop. We may or may not be able to move that tibia forward right? Depends upon how many of those fibers are popped, but the dog is uncomfortable. And then that's an, it's beginning to lead to an instability and that leads to osteoarthritis. I always hear people saying, oh, my dog injured, suddenly jumped and, 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 and injured his ligament or people um, say that too. You know, I, I was absolutely fine and suddenly my knee popped. And that is not true, correct? Like there is, there is more to it. As you say, there's inflammation. Uh, there is the change in the synovial fluid and uh, there's friction. And as a result, it's basically a gradual form of deterioration. I, you know, we have a saying in my mother tongue, uh, Czech language, that you carry the, the pitcher as long as it, you know, as it holds, but then one day the, the, the handle breaks off. And that's probably a similar situation, that it's a gradual process. I do want to add that 30, I graduated vet school 32 years ago, a long time ago. And when I graduated, I worked at a clinic that had six doctors and we saw maybe one a month. Mm -hmm. 
And that one was a trauma, a hit by car, a dog jumps in the air to catch a Frisbee. They come down, they land wrong. And it's a trauma. Nowadays, it's not a trauma. There are changes in our dogs and our pets that cause that inflammation. And then the inflammation is what leads to that tear. And that's why some of these dogs can literally be running across the backyard, not even step in a hole, scream and pick up a leg. The other thing to note is we talk about like spraining our ankle. A cruciate partial tear is a sprain until the fibers pop, 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 until it becomes a full tear. And you must have read my mind because that was exactly what I was going to ask you about why the incidence rises, why there are more cases of cruciate ligament tears. And I know that there are many factors like being overweight and, you know, exercise and uh, some exercise that is more impactful and also uh, dogs being spayed and neutered. Um, have you observed that as well in practice that, that the spayed and neutered dogs are more affected by this? The things we see from the research, because I, I love research, I'm totally a nerd when it comes to research, mm -hmm. is that dogs that are overweight are more likely to have a tear. Dogs that are spayed or neutered are more likely to have a tear. But we're also seeing cats, mm. small breeds, Maltese, dogs less than a year old. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different factors. And to be quite honest, we can say Yes, we see these and we don't know all of all of why these changes are happening. But yes, absolutely. Um, from the research, dogs that are spayed and neutered are more likely to have a cranial cruciate ligament rupture than dogs that are intact. And, you know, this is a challenging topic because um, we know that um, that dog homelessness is a serious problem and we don't we don't want dogs to suffer. But people don't realize that there are other more modern ways of sterilizing, and that is hormone sparing sterilization, whether it's vasectomy or ovary sparing spay. And uh, for everyone else, the biggest challenge in this evolution of the cruciate ligament tears and, and how it relates to spay and neutering is that the luteinizing hormone that normally stimulates the gonads to produce sex hormones doesn't have anywhere to go. And actually it latches onto the receptors in tissue among others, on the cruciate ligaments in the knee joints. And that's how it actually leads to inflammation. And as a result, cruciate ligament tears and degeneration and basically, um, you know, problems. I really want to emphasize that um, while we don't, or at least I, you may have a different opinion, but I, I suspect that we are pretty similar, that while I do understand that sterilization is necessary, especially the early sterilization and removing the sex hormones can lead to these problems. And for anyone who listens to this, please share it with your veterinarian. There is research. There is, a, there is an organization which is called parsemus.org, P-A-R-S-E-M-U-S.org. And they have extensive research, uh, papers and documentation and links that you can check and to share it with your veterinarian because we must, must, must change the status quo because otherwise we are going to see more and more problems. So what are the earliest warning signs that a dog is about to rupture or injure cruciate ligament? Uh, what should people look for? Let's go a step further. Before saying what's going to happen just before it tears, let's talk about trying to prevent the inflammation from coming and then knowing when inflammation is actually happening. So we talked about having the patella, right? The little bone here, it rides in that groove that we looked at here. And we actually, with a really simple test that I teach my, my good clients, they can tell when there's inflammation in the joint way, way, way before any of the fibers tear. And then they can take proactive measures to prevent the inflammation, to prevent the CCL tear. Now I'm all curious. I'm all curious. Tell me. <laughs> the patella sits here, and we can actually put pressure from the patella onto the femur as mm -hmm. we're bending and extending. So let's come back to this one. Right? So we have pressure on the patella. 
as we bend and extend the leg. And we will feel that actually grind on the femur when there's inflammation. Because when there's inflammation, mm -hmm. we know the joint fluid thins. So what does that look like? Sid, come, come. Yes. Thank He's you. He's such a good boy. Oh, my oh goodness. My Amazing. <laughs> Is he our soul dog, by the way? Oh, absolutely. He And he's so human. He literally, he sleeps under the covers and half the time he has his head on my pillow and I've literally woken up and he'll be like this under the covers. <laughs> like, so I'm like, you're human. I swear you're human. <laughs> all right. So first of all, here's his back. Here's his hip. We're going to come to his knee. And when we do this, there's two bumps on the knee. The top one is the patella or kneecap. And if you put your palm on the patella mm -hmm. and then here, you stand mm -hmm. up there. Thank you. F extend or open up the joint, flex the joint, bend it. If they have crepitus, so you would feel it going. Crunchy feeling, rough feeling, crunchy. rubbing. Yep. That is the first sign that there's inflammation in the joint way before we start tearing any fibers at all. So then my goal is for my clients and my patients is if we have any of that, and I literally check that every single time I see my patients, we get them on a chondroprotectant, so an oral supplement, and we give it three months uh, and an omega-3. If we if that doesn't help, at that point, we add an injectable and give that three months. And in most cases, we can get rid of that. If that doesn't work, then we add at-home laser therapy, where the clients are lasering not only to decrease inflammation, but also to increase stem cells so that we can prevent those injuries. And we, I've had an amazing, amazing look with that. Now, when you talk about the injectables, uh, do you mean glycosaminoglycans of some sort, Adequan or some other? Yep. And I can tell you, because I've been using it for so long, um, Adequan is my go-to. When they had a, um, a back order, oh, at least a decade, probably more like 15 or 20 years ago, uh, we had lots because we ordered lots. Mm -hmm. And... Clients that had switched that were getting their injections at another clinic, which is absolutely fine with me, were starting to get the other products and they didn't have the same effects. So mm -hmm. then they started mm -hmm. getting their shots with us, with the Adequan, and the better results came back. And again, and then when Adequan was supplied to everybody, like, okay, go back to your vet. You can get it done there. You don't have to come see me because mm -hmm. a lot of people mm -hmm. travel far mm -hmm. to see me. It was much smoother. So I do believe that Adequan is the best product out there. So if, we, if people discover that the synovial fluid is thinner and that there is rubbing, there is inflammation by examining the knee, that's the time when they actually have to go into a little bit of an overdrive and, and really make sure that the knee is protected yes. and uh, that they prevent uh, the progression of this injury. Yep. And, you know, inflammatory foods, when it comes to general inflammation, I myself have observed that if I don't behave with my food, that uh, my joints may be achy and inflamed. And that happens to dogs as well. So obviously, fresh homemade diet, whether it's cooked or raw, is something that I would recommend. In addition to omega-3s, absolutely, omega-3s are my go-to. Uh, my partner has, uh, he's a physiotherapist and um, he's had um, challenges with his thumbs. Mm -hmm. And he swears by omegas, you know, that's the only thing that he says helps. Um, what we have been doing as well, um, and I put, you know, five of my um, years uh, of work into creating a mobility support, fermented mobility support, that is some other ingredients, Ferna muscle, which is the, you know, food-based uh, glucosamine, let's say, uh, also chondroitin, MSM, turmeric in it, boswellia is uh, another ingredient in, in the product. Ginger, sting nettle for balancing and reduces the inflammation, reducing the inflammation and also toxicity in the body and the joint can lead to inflammation. So, you know, when we look at uh, the overall kind of balance, I love that you have all these different tools and that you are obviously very 
experienced and knowledgeable about how to prevent these injuries. And then when we add food and some of these uh, superfoods and, and supplements, uh, it can really make a huge difference. And I believe, and I would like to know as well, do you think that we can basically reverse the flow of events and prevent injuries, surgery, and uh, ultimately, you know, decrease mobility span in, in dogs? Do you think that that's possible? Oh, absolutely. I have lots of clients where we've gotten to, the, we found the crepitus and then put them into that program and gotten rid of the crepitus. And literally seven to 10 years later, there's still no crepitus. Lovely. Amazing. I, I do want to add, because most people don't know, obesity or even being overweight is a huge part of this as well, because white fat around the organs, the, the, the visceral fat specifically. The intra-abdominal fat, yes. Yep. That literally produces chemicals that cause inflammation all over the body. I agree with you. Oh, I was going to say, I myself too, if I eat um, gluten or too much white sugar, my hands get inflamed, my knees get inflamed. I live with that. So I totally try to work with my clients and my patients to have them be a nice, healthy weight. Um, I have to throw in there that the studies in humans, mice, and dogs, as well as non-human primates and others, show that being mm -hmm. of the appropriate weight, at least in dogs, you live up to two years longer or average of two years longer. In humans, it's like eight to 10 years longer. And then you add exercise and then you add mobility and strength and uh and it can make a huge difference. Uh, and I've seen that definitely in practice. And whenever, you know, you just start talking metabolism and intra-abdominal fat and, uh, and sugars and carbohydrates and, um, you know, many of these dogs have actually what in humans is called metabolic syndrome or, you know, it's basically a altered metabolism of, of sugar and insulin and uh, it leads to obesity and it leads to a whole bunch of, it's like a cascade of negative reactions that can really affect lifespan. And I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I'm very grateful that we get a chance to kind of intertwine the knowledge. And, and, you know, I always loved working with you and, and talking to you because the pieces of the puzzle that I'm not as knowledgeable about, you are awesome at. And, you know, and that makes me really feel like we are providing the best information to our, to our community. Now, I know that if a dog tears one cruciate ligament, studies show that uh, there is a 50% chance that, that the other knee will go. What would you recommend if a dog has one tear or history of one tear, how would you address it? Because then the, the leg is weaker, the other leg is getting more, more uh, stressed. And um, what would you recommend? How do you address that? So two things. Yeah, one is strengthening, right? Because it's the muscles, tendons, and ligaments around that knee uh, that we want to keep strong. So again, I'm, I'm visual, right? So the quadriceps and sartorius come this way and they help support it. And then the gastrocnemius comes from the back and it helps support it. So getting those muscles specifically stronger helps decrease the chance of that tibia moving forward. As well as, you know, we talk about strengthening muscles, but it's been shown in research that tendons and ligaments actually atrophy or get smaller without exercise. Mm -hmm. And conversely, with exercise can hypertrophy or get bigger and stronger. So we can literally be strengthening those cruciate ligaments in the other leg as the dog is in a safe manner exercising even while they're healing from that first tear. Rule of thumb is um, if you can keep them strong for 18 or 19 months, the chance that that other side is going to tear drops significantly. So mm -hmm. two factors, mm -hmm. Sid, I need you again. Sid, <laughs> I know. He says, where's the food, mama? Come on. He has to get paid. That's exactly what I was saying. You know, he's not getting any rewards. <laughs> so Right here. So the number one sequela or consequence we see when a dog tears a cruciate ligament is the the lack of flexing or bending their hock or tarsus. Mm -hmm. And you say, mm -hmm. well, why would that be? 
But when we look at biomechanically, every time they bend their hock or tarsus, that pushes the tibia forward. It's one of the ways we test, mm -hmm. right? Is we come up here and we say, if I bend the, 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 the tarsus, does that tibia come forward? If it does, absolutely, cruciate's torn. Mm -hmm. So when the dog is healing, even if they've had a surgery like a TPLO or a TTA, that doesn't stop that tibia from moving forward. So every time they sit or lay down, they say, I don't want to bend and go in this position. I'm going to take my leg out. I'm going to take my leg forward. And I'm not going to bend it because it hurts because it's putting pressure mm -hmm. on that joint. There's friction. Absolutely. So Absolutely. then as the dog heals, they stay like this. They lose, they, they have scar tissue that literally stops them from being able to do this, which means every time they transition from a sit or a down to a stand, mm -hmm. the only limb they can use is the other side. Mm -hmm. And the other side then has excess strain, which to me leads to a tear. It's not published. But one of my interns did a study. He was a surgeon. He is a surgeon who said, okay, these guys had rehab. These guys don't have rehab, um, which significantly included, let's make sure that we have normal range of motion at that hawk. The dogs that did not have rehab, and of course, there's other things, 50% mm -hmm. chance of tearing the other side within the next 18 to 19 months. The dogs that had rehab, 17% chance of tearing that other cruciate. And think about all the, the arthritis and the pain and the expense to the client. You know, I don't know what it is there, but here it's five to $6,000 for each surgery. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a big chunk of time and change and pain for the dog that if we can prevent it by keeping the range of motion normal in the hock, that to me is more important. I mean, it's certainly important Dogs that have a cruciate injury or surgery lose some extension in the knee, and we always want to get that back as well. But to me, the most important thing is keeping range of motion at the hock. You know, I, as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm thinking of the analogy of the, the hind leg stre strength and how important it is to the well-being and longevity of dogs. The same applies to humans, basically. Research has shown that... Uh, when humans lose their lower body strength, uh, that actually correlates with the lifespan and longevity. I love the idea that people can just basically not only determine whether there is something going on at home, but then they now know have they have the methodology or the understanding what needs to be done and connecting with their veterinarian also adjusting nutrition learning how to strengthen uh talking to a rehabilitation expert or some someone like that so it just you know it just kind of moves it moves the needle totally in a different position just by knowing what to do and and you're so good and eloquent in explaining everything it makes me really excited to actually publish this video and, 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 and have, have everyone to see it. There are some dogs that have gone through cruciate ligament injury and people do not know about it. How would, you, how would they recognize it? Do, what do they look for? Uh, and here's my knee and here's where the patella sits. This is the outside of the knee. This is the inside of the knee. It's not a bony change, yet there's a thickening that can happen right here and the only thing that causes it is damage to, so either partial or full tear of the cranial cruciate ligament. It's called a medial buttress. The only other place we see that is at the inside of the elbow when we have mm -hmm. arthritis or changes in the elbow. So anytime, and this is great for everybody to know, feel what it feels like on a normal dog. And then if you feel your dog, one side or the mm -hmm. other or both, starting to have a thickening here, oh my gosh. We know the only thing that causes it is appreciate damage or tear. And we want to pay double attention to prevent that. If it's either torn, we want to prevent the art secondary arthritis. And if it hasn't torn yet, we want to prevent it from happening. Mm -hmm. Can I throw one more piece of information in there? Absolutely. <laughs> in, in the U.S., at least. We're seeing more and more people own lasers at home. 
in my little realm, my little world, 70% of my clients have lasers. <laughs> and I'm one of them. Yes, yes. And thank um, you. Oh, you're welcome. So many people are doing um, regenerative medicine and stem cell therapy and PRP and things like that. And there's not a direct correlation between the two. We don't know that yet. There just hasn't been the research yet. Yet, we know on studies done on pigs for human medicine, they found that if you laser the ilium here and the inside of the tibia, so hold on. Here's the ilium, so this bone right here, and then if we come down to the knee, the inside of the knee, the tibia, right up here, there was studies done that they took a group of pigs, they caused a heart attack. They split the pigs, half of them had laser, not every day, just day two and day seven, so just twice. They didn't laser the heart, they lasered the ilium, and the tibia, the places I just showed you, at day, so it was day two and day seven. Day 10, they drew blood on all the pigs and they found the pigs that had had just those two times of laser had way, way, way more stem cells circulating in their blood, which are the cells that heal things. The cells that basically can turn into tissues and so on. They're the primordial cells. And it's almost like there's a factory of these amazing cells. Mm -hmm. And the laser wakes the factory up and say, okay, ready to work, uh, ready to produce some, some good, some stem cells. And the stem cells basically heal the tissue. So that's amazing. And, it, you know, it's also amazing that you're describing the study of uh, in, in pigs that these cells reach the heart and heal the heart. Yeah. And that can be done by laser. So that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. When they, at day 90, they euthanized all the pigs and they look at the damage in the heart. The average size of the infarct or the damage in the heart of the cell of the pigs that had just those two laser treatments was 68% smaller. Huge, That's huge, huge, 68%. So for our patients that have any arthritis or any degeneration or anything like that, we always recommend lasering the ileums, and the tibias. And again, that's something people can do with their vet or they can do at home. Not all veterinarians have been trained in diagnosing cruciate ligament um, this way and what you just suggested. And I know that sometimes uh, they may not see the early signs and they may wait until, let's say, there's a swelling or some sort of you know thickening of the joint capsule, and that's really evident. Do you have any recommendations how to approach these situations when actually our viewers and listeners may have this information and they go to the veterinarian, the veterinarian will tell them, well, everything is fine. And I'm not necessarily saying that everyone will do that, but, you know, nobody knows everything. So you're an expert and you're just kind of telling us how to determine if there is a problem. So if there is a situation like that, when, when there is a disagreement between the client and the veterinarian, what would you recommend doing or saying? I am the one who designed this test or figured this out, right? Um, and I teach as much as I can. It's why I have my teaching platform to help as many people as possible understand these things to prevent these injuries in these dogs. On our website, on optimumpetvitality.com, we have a place on top that says Learn and Go. And we've got about 100 different videos we have information on um, cruciate detection, prevention, prevention of the second one, uh, all kinds of great information. They're totally free. If a client anywhere in the world says, oh my gosh, there's crepitus at my dog's knee, and you're not going to feel it if you just bend and extend, you have to put pressure on that patella, on that kneecap, have their vet look at the website, right? If they're willing, it's, it'll take just a couple minutes and they'll understand it. It's coming from somebody who's not just not educated, right? I've spent 30 something years doing this and learning and trying to do everything I can to help dogs. There's a reason I have all those letters behind my name, right? <laughs> um, they're, I, they're also very helpful. They're just a, they're just a proof that uh, you definitely have dedicated your life to, to this, to your profession and that you love doing it. I'm sure that you wouldn't be spending as much time in at work if you didn't love it. And, you know, I attest to the website. I've taken some courses as well. 
and uh, you're extremely prolific. And, and there is no doubt that, that your passion comes through every single second of the videos. And, and uh, that's why I've been, I've been coming back to you and saying, hey, can we record more? So now I have two questions. The first one, are there any other ways of dealing with cruciate ligament tear if we already know I've diagnosed the tear? And it's inevitable that, that there is basically, it got to that point. Is surgery the best way to go? And the answer right now is yes. It is the gold standard. It is the fastest way to get out of pain and decrease. Decrease, not eliminate osteoarthritis. Anytime you cut into a joint, just cutting into it is going to create arthritis in itself. But by stabilizing that knee quickly or preventing that shear force, you're decreasing the progression of arthritis. Now, there's lots of dogs who can't have surgery. If it's a physical thing, like they have liver damage, they can't go under anesthesia, a brace can be used. It's not going to be dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. First of all, a brace that is not custom made is useless. There's studies that show that it may or may not stop shear force. A lot of them just stop flexion um, and they certainly don't change rotation. And that's not ideal, definitely, because if the knee stops moving even more, then you're, it, it's leading to more problems, problems. right? Right. Um, the custom braces are good. They don't stop. They stop shear. They decrease rotation, but they may not stop the rotation. But they're certainly better than nothing. And if you're going to do a brace, you need to do rehab with it. You need to mm -hmm. be doing the passive range of motion. Doing the underwater treadmill is really helpful. Doing laser or PEMF, pulse electromagnetic field therapy, um, icing. There's lots of things that you need to do with it to make, make it successful. And the most important thing that I want people to hear is if you can't afford surgery or a brace, don't put your dog to sleep. In six months, that knee will be stable. Okay or very darn close to 100% stable. And will you have arthritis? Absolutely. You know what? I have arthritis in my knees. I haven't had a, I haven't had a surgery. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, doc, they said I either needed to do this $5,000 surgery or put my dog to sleep. So I put my dog to sleep. And I'm like, no. <laughs> oh. I know. It's heartbreaking. It is truly heartbreaking. It, it just, uh, I just, I just had this visceral immediate reaction to it because I've seen I've seen dogs that actually obviously in thirty years of practice you see everything, and so I've seen that, and I definitely attest to what you're saying that the knee stabilizes and there will be arthritis and they may not be moving as well as if they had the surgery. And so whenever someone came to my practice and asked surgery or not surgery, um, I would always recommend surgery because I've seen the results and they can actually return to good quality of life faster than if um, if the surgery wasn't done. And I, I also agree with you that if the brace is used, that there are a whole other issues, a whole other set of issues caused because there can be more muscle atrophy and the dog will not use the leg at all or very little. And and so there are some other challenges. So now, now we're getting to the types of the, the repair, the surgery. In the past, we had only one, and that was the tightrope surgery, which was basically replacing uh, replacing the ligament with a nylon fiber. And I, I've done that in, in the old days. But I would like you to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the different methods and, 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 and give us at least an idea what they're like. So usually um, the two main surgeries that are done now are the TPLO and the TTA. So in the TPLO, the tibial plateau level, leveling osteotomy. So you're cutting the tibia here and you're taking this piece of bone and rotating it and then putting a break, putting a plate on it so it stays in place. And that sounds easy. It's not. They have to do all kinds of measurements. It's a really big procedure. There's Absolutely. multiple things that are put in place, but it stops. It doesn't take the place of the ligament. When you get done with the surgery, you can still move this tibia forward. What's happening is you're changing the plateau, the place where the femur sits, so that it doesn't move forward. Instead of it being sitting like they measure the angle, right? So it could be anywhere in here, they make it flat. Yes. That's the TPLO. 
it has the least complications. The TTA says, you know what, we can stabilize this instead of breaking this bone or cutting this bone here, we're gonna cut the bone here and we're gonna move this whole thing forward and then that's gonna change how that patella sits up here so that I have less slide. The downside of this is you have a little more complications of tearing the meniscus afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am not a surgeon. I am never going to tell a surgeon what surgery to do. They have to do what they feel best when they're looking at the tibial plateau, when they're looking at the size of the dog, mm -hmm. if the weight of the dog or cat, because now we're seeing them in cats too, what's the best surgery? Mm -hmm. A tight rope is where they drill holes in the bone and put um, a wire that goes through that's usually braided. It has more problems because the braided wire can um, wear away at the bone as the dog flexes and extends the knee. Mm -hmm. It's more likely mm -hmm. to have infection, but when done appropriately, um, and sometimes they're putting little pieces of metal in there to stop it from wearing the bone away. It can be done. Mm -hmm. The extra capsular is where they take, um, oh, there's lots of them. There's, they're moving the fibular head. They're taking mm -hmm. a piece Absolutely. of the, or the, the fascia and, and putting it around so that it helps stabilize. So there's all different types of surgeries. Again, my rule of thumb is pick the surgeon that you feel is the best qualified and let them choose the surgery that's right for your dog. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The last thing you want to do is take a surgeon who does one surgery all day long, five days a week or four days a week, because it's literally 80% of what they do and tell them to do a different surgery. Because then your dog is a pig instead of a, a patient. I fully agree with you. Um, you know, I, 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 I've obviously seen um, many dogs recovering and I have an idea which one I would choose for my dog, but I don't want to affect you and influence you by that. I would like to know, and I know that this is not going to happen to Sid, but if Sid theoretically had a cranial cruciate ligament tear, which methodology would you use if you had equally skilled surgeons in each? To me, the gold standard is the TPLO. And I say that with the caveat that if I went to a surgeon who I thought was excellent at what he did, and he said, Hey, Lori, I think X surgery would be a better case with your dog because X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. a hundred percent, I would go with his recommendation. And I love that answer. And I agree with you that I've seen, I've seen TPLO done many, many times, and it's a very demanding surgery. It's a very precise surgery and has to be done well. The worst case scenario is if you have a surgeon who says that, you know, that he's done something a couple of times and people go, okay, that, that should be fine. I actually just recently, and this can be off topic or on topic, we can leave it or cut it out. But I was looking for a surgeon for my benign um, salivary gland lump, just a little lump on my salivary gland that I discovered. And uh, I had one surgeon telling me that, um, that he's done the surgery twice and that the incision would have to be from the chin all the way to the ear. And the other surgeon does nothing but the salivary gland surgery. And then I inquired and asked him why he loves neck and throat surgery. And he said, well, you know, abdominal surgery was just too, it's too, too bulky and kind of like not, not refined enough, right? So as, as soon as he said that he likes little tiny things and I go, okay, he's the right surgeon, 35 and, you know, and, um, I'm scheduled for this and, and he's going to make just a small, a small incision just around my ear and it's not going to be even seen. So that's the same thing. When we're choosing anyone for anything, uh, whether it's a surgeon, whether it's an internal medicine specialist, dermatologist, uh, roofer, plumber, electrician, they have to have some sort of experience, right? So, yep. and we're just basically biological plumbers when it comes to veterinarians, right? Like we, it's not like that. I, I don't want to diminish the importance of understanding, you know, so many things in medicine, but, but it is, it is the same principle. We have to know what we're doing. And obviously I'm really grateful that you're here and telling us what to do about, about cruciates. And like you said, you know, this is something that I do day in and day out. Um, my DACBSMR, which is my longest set of, of letters, 
says that I'm board certified in sports medicine and rehab. Again, I'm not a surgeon. Talk to your surgeon. But I am one of less than 120 people in the world that do this for dogs. And I had the first rehab clinic in the world. So And the first treadmill as well. What underwater just, treadmill. Underwater treadmill, <laughs> yeah. Before there were boxes. Yep. I'd like to ask you about exercise. I know that some dogs tear ligaments when they retrieve balls or jump up for frisbees or do crazy things. Are there any types of activities that you would prefer dogs didn't do because they're not natural to them or they wouldn't do them often in natural settings? Let's say if they were in the wild. Okay, so I'm a mom who let my kids play football, who let my kids do wakeboarding, which if you don't know what that is, it's like a snowboard, but behind a boat where they would jump up eight feet, 10 feet in the air and come down and sometimes on their head. So I am not the kind of mom or vet that says, don't do what you love. My rule is to start out, get strong, to decrease your chance of injury. And then if you break, I'll fix you. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of highly, highly competitive world team dogs in agility and um, field dogs and, and water dogs. And I work with them so that they're less likely to get injured. And then if they get injured, I always tell my clients, If you're going to break your dog, do it just before you see me, not the day after you see me, (laughs) right? So I can fix them right away and then get them strong to prevent secondary injuries. And what exercises, which is where I think your head is going, is it totally depends upon where the dog is at. You always Mm -hmm. want to start with something that's easy and work up rather than Mm -hmm. saying, oh, my dog can do that and have them get injured because they're not strong enough. Because we do need to hypertrophy or strengthen tendons, ligaments, as well as muscle. Mm -hmm. And also by exercising and doing endurance stuff, whether it be walking, running, swimming, those things increase um, type one muscle fibers and it increases uh, blood flow to the muscle. So we're less likely to have a muscle injury or spasms or pain, as well as strength to help stabilize the joints. So it really is a mix of the two to Mm -hmm. totally increase the chance of injury and have best quality of life. And in the long run, decrease the chance of arthritis because 80% of dogs over eight years of age have arthritis. 20% of dogs over one year of age have arthritis. Mm -hmm. Our population spends billions of dollars every year on drugs to fight the arthritis. I would much rather prevent it early on with things you can do then have to deal with the pain and the the time commitments and all of the other things we do after it's already there. And, you know, you brought the topic of drugs on and I originally, I wasn't even planning to talk about them, but um, do you think that we can manage our dogs without uh, anti-inflammatory drugs uh, with rehabilitation, laser, exercise, pen, uh, supplements, um, do you think that we actually can prevent these drugs that obviously have their pros, but many cons like kidney liver disease, um, decreased healing, um, also dogs don't feel pain, then they move tissue and body parts that they should be resting and all that. Do you think that we can actually do it without these drugs? So my rule of thumb is better living through chemistry when needed. If we can take care of the pain with laser, PEMF, massage, um, manual therapy, ice, all of that natural stuff. That's my first. Supplements are right there with it, right? I'm on probably 20 pills a day. Yet when I go to the doctor, the first question out of their mouth is, who's your pharmacy? And I get to say, I don't have one. (laughs) Because with supplements, I've taken care of my body. I don't need to be on drugs right? Then if that's not enough, then go to the drugs. You know, people don't understand that um, we have evolved for a much shorter lifespan and dogs probably too. And we're dealing with conditions that in nature wouldn't even happen. And when people object sometimes, well, you know, I, I don't take supplements in nature. My dogs would not take supplements either. But we live under very different circumstances and much longer lives. And food is obviously different. We don't roam freely and, and pick herbs and do all that. So 
you know, I really love your philosophy that that um, drugs are there as the last resort, and we should not be orthodox about not using them. But we definitely, I, I'm a strong believer that we can, we can go, we can do much, much without drugs. And then if they're really needed to keep an animal comfortable or something like that, or human, then of course, but, but there, there's side effects, there are side effects and there's the, you know, there, there, it's definitely doesn't come without any consequences. So I forgot to ask you one question about, um, patella luxation when the kneecap mm. basically dislocates and whether it predisposes dogs to um, cruciate ligament tears as well. Yes. Can I show you with the model? Absolutely. You know, okay. I, I love your model. <laughs> All I right. Like, I like it even better, but this one is probably more appropriate right now. So we said the patella sits here. So it makes sense. We have the patella and I'll say this both ways, patella tendon or patella ligament. And you're like, oh, which is it? P tendon or ligament? It actually has fibers of both. So either way is appropriate to say, but it comes down to here, right? So it attaches like that. So it makes total sense that it, as the quadriceps come down, the sartorius comes down and attach here and it connects that, that it prevents that tibia from coming forward, which is what the cruciate's doing. So it's aiding the cruciate. Mm -hmm. So if instead of sitting here, it is laterally placed mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. more commonly medially placed, now it's not supporting that cruciate as much and we're more likely to have that tibia come forward. So with dogs that have a patella luxation, for me, um, it's grade one through four, right? Grade one is where it's in place. And if I push really hard, I can get it out. It wants to pop right back in. Grade two is where it comes in and out. Grade three is where it's out, but I can push it back in. And grade four is it's out and it's not going back in. It's it went for a walk. Somewhere. <laughs> right. And a lot of times it'll actually attach to the femur. So, yes, so yes. literally, if you wanted to fix it surgically, you'd have to break bone. Mm -hmm which mm -hmm. isn't worth it. Mm -hmm. So grade four, we don't do surgery. Well, again, I'm not the surgeon in my head. Grade four, there it would, it would not be beneficial to do surgery. Grade two and three, a lot of times surgery can be beneficial. Grade one, doing rehab and strengthening the mm -hmm. tendons, ligaments, muscle, everything around that, we can usually get it so that it's not clinical. The other thing to realize with patella luxation is if it pops out, Again, my clients are the best in the world. They're super smart. Mm -hmm. I teach them mm -hmm. how to feel so you can feel the groove being empty and then finding the patella and popping it back in so the dog doesn't live with it out here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And also we teach them that um, if, it, if their dog has their leg out extended way behind them, that is the dog's way of getting it into full extension to allow it to pop back in. Mm -hmm. So if you see your mm -hmm. dog hopping on one side, skipping, we call it, or stretching one leg all the time, just one leg, not both legs, back out behind them, that may be them trying to pop that back in there and you want to have somebody check it. They're trying to do their own physio. <laughs> and again, we want to protect that joint because if that, that patella is popping in and out, mm -hmm. that's going to create inflammation which is that long, slippery slope, or unfortunately, short slope to tearing the cruciate. And it's so just one joint capsule, right? The the patella and the and the the knee joint or stifle joint. Yep, it's one. The joint and the patella sits here, and the joint capsule comes way up here. Yes. So it's way above where you would think. So again, because I'm a nerd, when you laser, if you're lasering the knee. You don't want to just do this area down here. You want to come up on both sides of the patella mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even above it so that you get that joint mm -hmm. capsule and that cartilage up there mm -hmm. to help cartilage health, decrease inflammation, and help prevent problems. This has been absolutely fantastic, um, Dr. Lurie. I'm, I'm uh, very grateful for all your time. Is there anything else that you would like to add, either about medicine or your courses? Or I know that there's a giveaway as well and free gift for anyone who wants to 
who, who has a phone and can text. Uh, can you tell us about that? So uh, I do have courses because I do love to teach. I have pet parent and professional courses. Um, they, people can check out our website, optimumpetvitality.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. I just did a great lecture on YouTube. We have courses on exercise that literally I designed the exercises for Sid because he has a predisposing. Oh, that's one thing to talk about. Predisposing factor. Sid, come here. Hop, hop, hop. Thank you. There you go. So predisposing factor for, so more likely to have a cruciate injury if the knee is straight. I have to pick him up so you can see. But when he stands, he stands with his knee and it looks straight mm -hmm. like this. As compared to like a German Shepherd, which would be standing like this. So the things that we see are dogs who are more straight legged are much more likely to have a cruciate injury. Less of an angle. Yes. Less of an angle. Yep. So when I got Sid, I said, you have straight knees, your straight shoulders, right? His, his scapula doesn't sit like this. It sits like this. Mm -hmm. And you have a long back. I'm a rehab vet. My goal is for you to never have a shoulder injury, a cruciate injury, or a back or psoas injury. Okay. okay. So you. you have a goal to keep him healthy for the whole life. And, and, um, and it's nice. It's nice to combine the specialty with um, your heart kind of mission as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I said, I'm a rehab mom. <laughs> I don't want you to have the pain or problems with a back injury, a shoulder injury, a knee, a cruciate injury. So I designed an exercise program to protect all of that. And then I had some of my friends do it and they went, oh my God, Lori, that's amazing. My dog is stronger. I can see the dog's muscles that mm -hmm. I thought my dog was strong. And I'm talking about agility people who like do agility and herding and obedience. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I thought my dog was strong. My dog is a totally different dog. One of my clients slash friends dog at nine started the exercise program at 11. She was the seventh fastest Sheltie in bad dog agility. <laughs> so every other dog was four, five, six. And here she is at 11 being the seventh fastest dog. And it, you don't have to be an athlete doing the exercises is like us going to the gym. It just makes us healthier, less likely to get injured. And all of the exercises are in the exercise course um, on Optimum Pet Vitality. So that is core and more foundational exercises for your dog. It's 24 exercises. It's just a great program. Amazing. So I have that program. And then we have at-home laser therapy. So if you have a laser or if you want a laser, it goes through all the different joints. So you know how to do it appropriately. Not that doesn't mean you should never get laser or go to your vet. Absolutely, you should. But there's so much research that shows that doing it, not every day, that is not correct, but a couple, once or twice a week where you have problems significantly decreases mm -hmm. your arthritis, your pain, all of these things that allows you to be more active and more healthy to have optimum quality of life. I just love to nerd out with you. <laughs> and then the last thing is the giveaway, right? So if people text the word healthy, and I have to look, right? Um, the word healthy, so H-E-A-L-T-H-Y to the phone number 866-949-0068. So 866-949-0068. You get the top five exercises for geriatric dogs, but it can be used in any dog. And it's a great place to start. Amazing. Thank you so much for bringing so much uh, wisdom and knowledge. And, uh, you know, as I'm sitting here, I really, he, I may have not told you, but, but he came to my life as a colleague and also as a friend. And I've always had um, this kind of vision or dream that, that everyone brings something different, different perspective together. And, and today we've learned so much about cruciate ligaments and so on. And when you add uh, my little focus, uh, which is uh, nutrition and metabolism and, and herbs and, and healing through foods and, and superfoods and uh, formulating supplements, um, I know that when we put all this together, 
that we can actually achieve better results. And that's what makes me feel really good. And if anyone is looking for a joint support and mobility supplement, uh, it is jointbuttersupplement.com. Again, jointbuttersupplement.com. And thank you so much, Lori, for being here. And uh, well, I'm, I'm sure, I hope we will have another talk soon. Take care. Great. Thank you.